Welcome along to uh, part two of this series of videos uh, about the Acorn System Computer. Now, you may remember that in part one, um, we did a bit of boxing and unboxing, built lots of Euro cards, made some front panels, then threw them away, had a mental breakdown and bought a Dragon 64, created an Acorn Prestel terminal, rescued a BBC Micro from a Land Rover, and dug a grave in the garden. And after all of that, I ended up with a trio of genuine, non-original, 40-year-old Acorn System computers. So in this video, I'll be answering some questions from part one. We'll take a look at some of the system software that's available for these machines. And I'll try and describe ways in which you can build one of these things without having to sell a kidney. And if you stay till the end, I'll show you how useful a tester, such as this ferret tester, can be to sort out all your build issues. So let's start by trying to answer a few of the questions from part one. Now, they broadly fall into two categories. There are the sensible ones, and then there's all the others. Believe it or not, there was at least three people who were quite serious when they said that I'd not left a link in the description for the magic hole making kit. Well, funnily enough, I've not left a link in this video either. Now, somebody called Bill asked me if I could make him a System 3 computer. There were quite a few others who asked me the same question. Now, obviously, um, I've built three system computers here, so clearly I can. I just don't want to. I understand where Bill is coming from, of course. Um, these things, although they're new, they represent the early days of Acorn computers. And I guess if you're a collector of old computers, you're going to enjoy owning one of these machines without the hassle of having to make it. But for me, it's more about trying to experience these things as you might have done back in the day. Um, and so I decided to build one for myself. Um, that and the fact I couldn't actually find anybody to build one for me. The problem I've now got is that a table is about to collapse, so I'm actually thinking of selling the system too. One comment I did get, um, which got me thinking, was from Aldo B, who said that me saying these things were easy to build didn't take account of the fact that it could cost an arm and a leg. Now obviously spreading the cost over 40 odd years kind of helped me somewhat, but he's right, these things can swallow up funds very quickly. I remember back in the day that the high cost of building one of these things was you know, one of the things that, that ensured you took your time over it. Um, I mean, it could be frustrating, but at least it allowed you to savour the experience. And I imagine it would have been a bit less overwhelming. Now, it's hard to imagine now, but people back in the day who had computers only generally had one. And to be honest, they were few and far between. So building a small machine with only a few cards would automatically put you in the elite of the uh, electronics or computer hobbyist. I mean, once you were a member of this hobbyist elite, you could then spend your time building and collecting more cards and eventually be able to do something really useful, assuming you could think of something. I suppose today it's more about enjoying these things as part of a larger collection of computers rather than a collection of cards or expansions or whatever. Although, to be honest, some people have taken things a bit far, if you ask me. Even so, I would definitely recommend taking Acorn's advice from back in the day, and that was to start small and build the system up over time. Obviously, if you're getting on a bit like me, then that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but if you're younger, as most people seem to be, you have the option to take your time and spread the cost. I think there's something very satisfying about doing things slowly. For a start, all the frustrations are spread out over time, uh, which means by the end, you can't actually remember what they all were. And also you sort of become, it becomes more than just a thing. Um, it sort of becomes part of your soul and I suppose it could end up being part of your legacy as well. Now I know a guy who quite recently started with the three cart system and they suddenly ended up with three complete systems. Um, I understand he's thinking of selling one though. If you do decide to build one, um, the one tip I would give is not to get carried away like I did. Um, that is not the way to save money. After all, apart from a power supply and a keyboard, you only need to build four boards and a backplane to build a system too. Um, in fact, later on I'll show you how you can do it with only three boards. I mean, you don't even need a card frame. I mean, these things can be quite expensive, even secondhand, especially when you factor in the card guides. If you do decide to build one of these things without a card frame, you have to make a few decisions up front. And it's all about how you mount the female. 
Now the female connectors for these card frames fasten on the back like so. Oop, I'll try and put that there. And then typically the back plane would sit between them, joining them all up. I mean, obviously you could wire them together, wire wrap if you wanted, but you can get these back planes and I'll explain later. Um, they fit between them, that's great. Now some of the racks that you might buy don't have this ledge here. The screws are on the end, um, which means that in order to, excuse me, in order to do it, you kind of need a wider back plane like that. So the female connectors mount differently. They mount and solder to there, and then this is fastened to the back. So the question is, which back plane do you buy? Um, well, if you're anything like me, um, you can pretty much guarantee whichever one you choose, you wish you chose the other one. I mean, I've got a couple here, so I've got options, I suppose. Now, I'll leave a link to all of these things in the description. Uh, Chris oddy has got details of all of this stuff. He makes these things. Uh, and there's a shop there as well to allow you to buy them. They're not expensive. There may be an added complication in that it depends what system you're going to, to build. Now, if you're going to build a System 2 or a System 3, you need what's called a buffered black backplane. So a backplane that's got buffer chips in, or at least gives you the option to fit them. Because the processor boards uh, in these machines, it's the same process in each machine, there's no buffering of the address or data bus. Now, if you're going to build a System 5, um, which I can't show you, uh, but this is a 6809 machine, which by swapping that card, I can turn it into a System 5. Um, the 6809 processor and the 6502A, which is using the System 5, has buffer buffering on the board. So you need a plain back plane like the one I just showed you. Hang on, I dropped it. So you need a plain one with no buffering at all, such as that or the narrower one, depending on what rack you've got. I hope that makes sense. Now, like I said, I'll leave a, a link to Chris on his website. Um, it's got all the details and, and how to, to order them and so on. Um, the connectors are relatively cheap, uh, but of course you could end up buying quite a few of them, depending on what you're building. Um, when I was fortunate, I managed to get hold of some second-hand ones from Pete at Short Circuit. Thanks, Pete. Now, these wire up ones can take a little time to, uh, to unwire, but if you carry a bag of them with you wherever you go, you get five minutes you can just unwire a few and and you may find it helps to buy a wire wrap tool which will allow you to um, unwrap them in like so now you can often get secondhand um, connectors off old back plane back plane such as this um, you know if you're looking to get frustrated this is definitely the way to go and if you don't have a rack or case there's nothing stopping you building your own like I did for my NASCON I mean, if you take your time, it can look quite professional. Once you do get yourself a rack sorted, you can save yourself some money by making your own front panels. And not like this. Now these front panels here are five horizontal points wide. Now a horizontal point is about a fifth of an inch. So obviously five of them means they're an inch wide. Now I know what you're thinking, we should be using metric because obviously it's easier. Well, a horizontal point it's 5.08 millimeters wide, uh, and there are five of them, obviously. And then to make the uh, accurate measurement, you then reduce it by 0.4 millimeters. So let's try that. <clears throat> so what have we got? 508E minus, oh. oh. Hang on, right, point. Oh, 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 any, look, anyway, it's an inch. Now that's handy because um, recently, just before I made the video actually, I went to B&Q and found this aluminium bar. Now this aluminium bar is exactly one inch wide. So you can make your front panels out of this. And as you can see, it looks pretty good. Now I think this was about five or six pounds and you could make half a dozen out of this. So that's a cheap way to get your front panels. And I must give a big shout out and a thank you to Chris Oddy, who on his website has published all of the drilling details for all of the different cards. So that helps no end. Now, if you do make your own card fronts, you could always put a bit of U-shaped bar or angle on there to make a handle if you wanted to. Um, now the cards fit on the front panels with these plastic brackets, which you can buy from Veritech and they're not especially expensive. But obviously if you end up with needing a lot of them, it starts to add up. Um, these particular ones were 3D printed, and I'll leave details of this, links to these, um, 
in the description. Obviously, uh, one thing you will need is a power supply. Um, I just use these cheap Meanwell power supply units. Um, they're relatively cheap from places like DigiKey and so on. Um, and they're just mounted behind these front panels. Um, these are just dummy panels here um, and the power supply is mounted on the, on the frame inside. This one, uh, very fortunate, I have a genuine Vero power supply here, 5 volt power supply on my 6809 stroke system 5 machine. Um, I've only got a 3.5 inch disk drive so I don't need 12 volts or anything, um, so 5 volt is fine. Uh, on these ones the power supply is a um, 5, 12, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 12, although I'm not using all of the rails. But they're there if you need to, you know, want to do something else. Now the keyboard could end up being one of the most ex expensive items. Um, now Chris Oddie and Trevor Hamlet both have produced circuit boards that allow you to make a keyboard from a BBC or Electron keyboard. Now I was very fortunate in that my BBC Micro got run over by a Land Rover and I had a spare, left me with a spare keyboard. Now that's what I've used to build this here. Now BBC Micro keyboards do pop up on eBay every now and then. I don't know, between about 25 and 35 pounds. Um, the thing is that you'll probably end up spending the same again or more uh, for the encoder chip. This chip here, what's well, on here. So it can start to add up. Uh, and also some of the options for keyboard circuit boards um, rely on using an electron key with the BBC keycap. So that can add a layer of complexity uh, and possibly cost. Once again, I'll leave links for all of this in the description. So turning our attention to the software, uh, we have the cassette operating system for the system two, um, or at least we did have. Unfortunately, just before filming, um, I discovered that I'd erased the cassette operating system EEPROM um, by mistake. Now, <clears throat> I know why I did it. I know, I know why it happened. It's because I'm a complete idiot. Now we also have the disk operating system for the Acorn System 3. Um, in fact, here it is here. Um, let's have a look what's on the disk. There we go, okay. We can type a command on the disk. Okay, uh, and at the moment that's using the GoTech. I do have a floppy drive in there, but I'm just using the GoTech while I build up the machines and get them all working. There's also Acorn's uh, 6809 monitor, not unsurprisingly, is for the 6809 machine. This is it here, we're just looking at the register values, and it is really a monitor. Um, there are options to um, change memory and so on in the usual way. And we can also boot from disk, but we don't have a bootloader. I mean, it's something I'm going to try and write, and then we can start loading other software on. Somewhere out there is a version of Acorn's implementation of Flex for this machine. Um, so if you know where that is, um, please let me know. Um, it'd be great to, to see this running flex. And then of course there is basic, uh, which I've got on disk here. There we are. Which is basic really. There are also some disk based utilities. Um, for formatting and copying and so on, uh, which is handy. There are also versions of Lisp um, and Pascal, uh, and a fancy editor which is designed to work with daisy wheel printers, which I'm sure you've all got. Thanks to Chris Oddy, um, there is also software to better support Acorn's PROM programmer card, and best of all, his own RAM tester, which I've used extensively because of the ridiculous number of RAM cards I've built. Now I'm sure it'll get used some more because I don't seem to be able to stop building these things. Hmm. There's also Acorn's development environment called ADE, which to be honest, I don't know too much about because I have a simpler way of doing things. It's maybe something I ought to take a, a look at, a closer look at. But I'll explain how I kind of do my dev later. Um, we also have Prestel software. Um, now you may remember from part one that I built a Prestel terminal uh, for the 6809 system um, and just after that Andrew Gordon of Acorn got in touch to say he had the source code for the original System 3 version. Um, but to be honest I couldn't resist writing something that was a bit more modern, maybe worked with more modern modems. Um, 
but also uh, could be put into ROM for the System 2 machine or operated from disk on the System 3. Um, so really now we have Acorn's original Prestel, we've got Prestel for the 6809 and we've got Prestel for the um, System 3 that will work on a System 2 as well. Now I want to add tele software to these machines at some point, I think it'd be an interesting alternative to cassette or disc. So speaking of alternatives to uh, cassette or disc, check this out, Econet. You can see we've got some files on the server now that I've logged on. So we can load basic directly from the server. Um, let's just run basic. Uh, and then we can load our basic files from the server. No cassette or disc needed. But you do need a BBC Micro, second processor, a load of disk drives and a level 3 file server. Now I said earlier that I'd not used the Acorns development environment on this machine. Um, I said I had a simpler way and that is to cross compile everything on my Mac or my Linux box. So I have 6502 development and I use a modern editor and then use a make file to launch the Merlin32 assembler and test it in main. I know that many of you will be thinking that I shouldn't be using Make to launch tests in this way. All I can say is that I will answer all comments with courtesy and respect, no matter how silly they are. Now, as a recent convert to the 6809, it does seem a little backwards to be doing everything uh, longhand in 6502. Um, but on the plus side, there are so few 6502 instructions that with my failing memory, I can still remember them all. Lots of people tell me how elegant the 6502 is, and I try and remember that when I'm uh, make, you know, doing 16-bit operations or trying to make subroutines relocatable. For 6809 development, I use the same kind of system, uh, but I use LW Tools as the assembler. Now, to help with all this, I wrote a disk utility that allows me to uh, create and manipulate disk images for the system range of computers. Now, the system disk format is subtly different from later Acorn's uh, machines, um, so a disk utility is quite useful, really. And I can add a call to it in the make file so I can create uh, the binary files and place them on a new disk at every build. Now, I know there'll be people out there that shouldn't be doing that using make. All I can say is that I answer all comments with courtesy and respect, no matter how silly they are. I'll leave a link to the utility in the description. To test on real hardware, um, I use these GoTek, I've temporarily added these GoTek drives. Um, the disk images created during the build process uh, can be used directly with these. Now if you don't have a disk controller in your system, such as this system 2, there are ways to get software onto these machines without having to revert to cassette tape um, or Econet or waiting for tele software to arrive. Earlier I mentioned that for a system 2 you could build one using only three cards. Um, typically we'd use four. You'd need a CPU card, a cassette um, card, uh, VDU card, this is an 80 column one, uh, in here we've got 40 column ones, typically in a system 2 it would have been a 40 column, but uh, and then you'd have a memory card. Now, you can actually build the thing without the cassette card. Now, if you have a look at the back of this machine here, you can see that I've added a serial port, which is connected directly to the CPU card where the cassette interface would normally connect. Now, a TTL to RS-232 converter is built into this connector housing to give me a standard RS-232 type port on the back. Now on this machine here, I don't have that arrangement at the back, I never got around to fitting it. Um, but what I've done is I've just mocked up a, a board here, which has got a MAX-232 here, uh, connections for, the, for to, to go to a serial port on a PC or laptop or whatever, and then this is connected to the various pins um, that are connected to the cassette input-output on the processor card through the back plane. Uh, I then created a simple utility uh, to allow files to be converted to and from Acorn's cassette format. Now, these can then be transferred using ordinary serial software, such as Minicom or whatever it is you use. Um, now, you just use the cassette operating system, but instead of starting a cassette play, you would just fire off your, well, send in your file with your terminal software. Uh, the 6809 monitor also has cassette functionality, so it works fine for both of these two. Uh, obviously, in this bottom one, I've got a disk anyway. 
A call to the utility can easily be added into the make file or the build script to create a binary anchor set format file on each build. Now I know many of you will be thinking that I shouldn't be doing that in a make file. All I can say is that you get the idea. Now I'm quite lucky in that during my obsessive phase I built a couple of these battery backed memory cards, these Kumen boards. Um, what this means is that I can load software into memory here um, and it's battery backed of course and it saves me having to write uh, EEPROMs every time I want to test software on the hardware. Um, I can pop it into memory, I can position the uh, where the memory is going to appear in the memory map and I can write protect that and that means I can change it on the fly or, or simply reload it each time. Uh, and it, as I say it's battery backed. Back in part one of this video series I had a bit of a rant about many museums having shelves full of duplicate machines um, and my concern really was that the difficulty that accredited museums have in getting rid of the parts of their collection or disposing of their collection it kind of meant that they're always going to be staying there and probably taken out of circulation. Now based on comments it seems like many of you agree but have concerns about leaving your loved ones um, all of your kits sort out and so leaving it to a museum seems like a simple thing to do. Except of course that museums because they have difficulty in storing and disposing of things often have policies in place that would prevent them from taking them in the first place which doesn't really help your loved ones much. What is needed is some kind of continuity planning. So work out what it is you want to do with all your stuff and then arrange with your retro mates for them to, to dispose of it, you know, sell it, give it away give it to a museum or whatever. Having said that, um, obviously if you do have something unusual or unique, then obviously donating it to a museum is the best thing to do. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't have anything like that, but if something that, like that turned up in my loft and my retro mates were going through all my stuff, then they would make sure it got donated to the right place. Obviously, if you do have some interesting stuff and you don't have any friends, then get in touch. Now, okay, I know how that sounds, but what I'm saying is I do know people that will ensure that your stuff will live on in the community, be respected um, and, and will be handled in a not-for-profit way. Obviously if you've got more stuff than will practically fit in a Ford Transit then it's probably time to be making extra friends. So what now? Well I still need to make some custom panels for these sorts of areas um, and obviously I'd like to swap the drives for the Gotex, get them all working properly but then after that I thought maybe I could take a closer look at some of the other earlier machines I've got. I mean I have a Kim 1, Cosmic Elf, perhaps this Softy, and of course my Mark 14. And I still want to build this new bear. Okay I know it's an MK14 not a Mark 14, it's just a private joke. Um, I'm perfectly aware it was named after a postcode in Milton Keynes. Now while we're on the subject somebody did tell me recently that it was it stood for Micro Computer Kit 14 because it was a kit and had 14 chips, which is obviously wrong because um, I got this ready built and it's got 18 chips. Anyway, if any of this is of interest or you suffer from insomnia and you think it might help, um, then feel free to let me know in the comments. In the meantime, don't forget to like, subscribe or whatever, and I'll see you next time.